my question to you, sir. Do persons get or have they become born again by Acts 2, 38? All right. Let's go to work in the Bible. And not only that, being that you're emphasizing Israel, are you saying salvation is just for Israel? No, salvation right. was for the Jews first. Yes. And then yes. salvation for the whole world. Oh, so it is for everybody. So we got to rightly, according to 2 Timothy 2.15, mm -hmm. we must rightly divide. So salvation time. is for everybody. Everyone, but it must be rightly divided because there's different salvation in the Bible. I just want to know is salvation for everybody? For everyone, but everybody don't get saved the oh, way I, Israel got saved. The way I mean, we get saved how, today. How many ways is it to be born again? Theological debates have long been a cornerstone of religious discourse, providing a platform for the exploration of complex and often contentious issues within various faith traditions. One such debate, involving Pastor Gino Jennings and an attendee in the Bahamas, serves as a compelling case study in understanding the divergent perspectives on the nature of God, salvation, and the role of repentance and baptism. Pastor Jennings, known for his unyielding adherence to a strict interpretation of the Bible, engages with the attendee on these critical issues, highlighting the enduring significance of scriptural interpretation and theological clarity in contemporary religious practice. There are many ways in the Bible. To be born again? No, to be born again, because you, Mr. Jennings, Pastor Jennings, cannot be born again. Sir, how many ways, according to the Bible, is it to be born again? Only one way we can be created. I didn't ask A new that. creature. Uh, sir? But born again. Just, just a minute, sir. I didn't ask you how many ways to be created. I ask you how many ways is it to be born again? Because if we are born again, we was already born the first time, which is our natural birth coming from the womb of our mothers. Agreed. But if it says born again, then he's instituting what Jesus declared to be a new birth. So then, how many ways is it to be born again according to the Bible? At the heart of Pastor Jennings' argument is the assertion of God's sovereignty and omniscience. Jennings emphasizes that God is all-knowing and does not require advice or counsel from anyone. This foundational belief underscores the theological principle that God is fundamentally different from humans, possessing an infinite understanding that transcends human limitations. Jennings critiques the modern tendency to humanize God or presume that humans can offer guidance to the divine, arguing that such notions are not only theologically erroneous, but also reflective of a broader societal trend towards diminishing the transcendence of God. This theme of divine sovereignty is intricately connected to Jennings' views on salvation. The debate between Jennings and the attendee centers on the attendee centers on the nature of salvation and the means by which one can be born again. Jennings firmly holds that there is only one way to be born again, as outlined in the teachings of Jesus Christ and the Apostles. He references Acts 2.38, where Peter preaches about repentance, baptism in the name of Jesus Christ, and the receipt of the Holy Spirit. Jennings argues that this message is not limited to the Jews, as the attendee suggests, but is a universal call to all nations and peoples. So if the body of Christ has to be created anew, how do we get in that body? Very good question. How do we get in? That's, that's, the, that's the best question ever was put to me in my 70 years. How do we get into the body according to the Bible? First Corinthians chapter 15, 1 through 4. Read Hold it. it. Let's go to work in the Bible. <laughs> Let's go to work in the Bible. First Corinthians chapter 15. 1 through 4. 1 through 4. First Follow me in the Bible. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 4. All right. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, mm -hmm. which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, mm -hmm. unless ye have believed in vain. Yes. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures mm -hmm. at verse four and that he was buried 
and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. All right. The attendee, on the other hand, presents a broader interpretation of salvation, citing various scriptures such as Colossians 1.18, 1 Corinthians 15, 1, 4, Ephesians 1, 4, Ephesians 2, 8, 9, Ephesians 4, 30, and Galatians 3, 26, 27. He contends that salvation is through faith in Jesus Christ and that the specific message of Acts 2, 38 was directed at the Jews gathered for the Feast of Pentecost. This interpretation suggests that while repentance and baptism are important, the essence of salvation lies in the acceptance of Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, a perspective that emphasizes the universality of the gospel message and its applicability to all people, regardless of their cultural or religious. Jennings counters this argument by returning to the foundational teachings of Jesus Christ. He asserts that the Apostles' message, including that of Peter in Acts 2.38, derives directly from Jesus' teachings. Jennings emphasizes the necessity of repentance and baptism in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, arguing that this command is central to the Christian faith and is applicable to all believers. He cites Luke 24.47, where Jesus commands that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations beginning at Jerusalem. This, Jennings argues, demonstrates the universality of the message and its relevance to all who seek salvation. I gave you time to talk, and I'm still elaborating on the scripture you gave. So let me finish. God give it. Here, here, here. Let me finish now. I'm elaborating on the scripture, scripture you gave. It's you God said word. say. Is that God word? Oh, yes. Okay. That's all, that's all we're dealing with. Let's rightly divide it. That's all we're dealing with. Okay. All right. You are saved if you keep in remembrance what is preached unto you, lest you believe in vain. I believe that with my whole heart. Oh, yes. Now let's go to the one that taught the apostles, because the apostles got to remember what was preached to them. That's right. Luke. Luke chapter 24 and at verse 47. That's what? And that repentance. Oh, we got to remember this. And that repentance. And that repentance. And remission of sins. And remission of sins. Should be preached. Should. Should be preached. How? In his name. Where? Among all nations. Beginning where? Beginning at Jerusalem. Let's go to Jerusalem. The debate further delves into the concept of grace and truth. The attendee posits that grace is personified in Jesus Christ, referencing Titus 2.10, 11 to support his claim that grace is a person and not merely an abstract concept. Jennings agrees with this assertion, but maintains that Jesus did in fact preach about himself and his role in salvation. He references passages such as John 14.10, where Jesus speaks of his unity with the Father and his role in the divine plan of salvation. This, Jennings argues, is evidence that Jesus' teachings are intrinsically linked to his identity and mission, and therefore, understanding Jesus' role is essential for comprehending the nature of salvation. Throughout the debate, Jennings emphasizes the importance of adhering to the scriptural foundation of the Christian faith. He argues that the teachings of Jesus and the apostles provide a clear and unequivocal path to salvation, one that requires repentance, baptism, and the receipt of the Holy Spirit. This perspective underscores the significance of maintaining doctrinal purity and resisting the temptation to dilute or reinterpret the foundational tenets of the faith. The attendee, while respectful of Jennings' views, raises important questions about the interpretation and application of Scripture. He emphasizes the need for rightly dividing the word of truth, as instructed in 2 Timothy 2.15, suggesting that different contexts and audiences within the Bible may necessitate different approaches to understanding salvation. This perspective highlights the dynamic and evolving nature of theological discourse, where believers are called to engage with Scripture thoughtfully and critically, seeking to understand its implications for contemporary faith and practice. The debate between Pastor Gino Jennings and the attendee in the Bahamas serves as a microcosm of the broader theological discussions that continue to shape the landscape of modern Christianity. It underscores the enduring significance of scriptural interpretation, 
the centrality of Jesus' teachings and the importance of theological clarity in understanding the nature of salvation. As believers navigate the complexities of faith in an ever-changing world, such debates provide valuable insights and foster a deeper engagement with the timeless truths of the Christian tradition. In conclusion, theological debates, like the one involving Pastor Gino Jennings, are vital for the ongoing development and refinement of religious understanding. They challenge believers to confront difficult questions to seek a deeper comprehension of their faith and to articulate their beliefs with conviction and clarity. By engaging with these debates, believers can strengthen their own theological foundations and contribute to the broader conversation about the nature of God, salvation, and the role of repentance and baptism in the Christian life. Through rigorous examination and respectful dialogue, the faith community can continue to grow in its understanding and appreciation of the profound mysteries of the divine. Did you enjoy this heated debate? Please leave your comments below.